Now let's talk more about modularity. And this is a sort of stock modularize the code sort of exercise. And it gives a hint, it says use these two things. To be honest, it should just say modularize the code. We don't need to use new features for the sake of new features. What we need to do is avoid redundancy and duplication in our code however we can, using loops, using whatever a named constant is, using functions if necessary. It's true that modularity can help um, make your code maintainable because the less duplication you have, the easier it is to fix a problem and maybe the easier it is to read the code. But also you should consider that if you use functions to give you modularity, if you take a task that you're often repeating inside your program and you write a function for it, then it doesn't just make that program easier to work with. It can also help you in the future. Because if you write a function that does some common task, and this exercise, maybe unsurprisingly, will use a function to compute the area of a circle. If you write a function to compute the area of a circle, you can use it in this program, but you could also copy and paste it into every other program you ever write. There, there are functions and, and bits of modularity that I wrote 10 years ago that I still use. I still copy and paste it into new programs. So it's a very powerful technique and it can save you time not just now but in the future. Um, but the task here is modularize the code using by any means necessary. Do whatever you can to remove duplication and any hazards that might result in tedious modification later. In general, that means any duplication. So you might notice I'm using type float. Um, that's just to clean up some of my arithmetic so I don't need any more significant digits. And what I'm doing is computing the area of circles over and over again. Like in one of the earlier function examples, I can't use a loop to condense this code down because I'm, I'm operating in strange increments. Okay, 6, then 10, then 17, then this number. I can't easily use a loop to, to combine all those cases. What I want to do is I want to take it all the way to the end. I want to make this code as compact as possible. So the first thing I'm going to observe is that in, I don't think it's necessary to compact this part. I guess if I'm changing the radius at each step, if I'm computing the area of a circle over and over and over again, I guess I should say what that is. I, you know, how rude of me. Um, area of a circle with radius r. So as you may know, the, ra the area of a circle that has a particular radius r is pi times r squared. And now I've written it down so we can see it. I guess I'm just going to go right ahead and erase it again in a minute. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm computing pi r squared by just typing in the value of pi at each step. I'd say that that's probably the first thing that bothers me. Now, I don't think the value of pi is ever going to change, obviously, but if I have to keep copying and pasting it, there's a chance that maybe a, you know, an error sneaks in, like a typo sneaks in at some point, um, and it's also a bit ugly. Now, there's also this third issue that isn't as obvious with pi. Because if you look at code or uh, mathematical equations anywhere else, and you keep seeing 3.1415, you'd probably look at that and say, okay, obviously that's pi. But if you look at an equation and you just see a, a constant just sitting there and there's no explanation of what it's doing there, that can be really confusing. It isn't helpful to have what we call magic numbers, where there's a constant value just sitting there with no explanation, because that means if you read the code later, you might not know what that means. It may not be as obvious. I mean, some constants like pi are celebrities, and so you know what they are, but it might not be obvious what that constant does. So one thing I'm going to do to make my code easier to read and more modular is I'm going to give this constant a name because I, I can do that in C I could just make a basically I could make a variable for it called pi okay and now instead of using the constant at each step I could just write pi and that's nice because it makes it even more obvious that I'm computing the area of a circle now there is one hazard in, that's introduced here first I'm gonna run this I guess I should have already done that but I'm going to run it. Okay, there are some areas of circles. Uh, maybe you can look at the case with radius 10 to observe that it does appear to be computing the area correctly. Um, there is a hazard that could occur. I'm now using a variable as a clever way of giving a name to a number, which I think makes the code more readable. But because I've used a variable, I mean, how does the compiler know that it's special? I could do something like this by accident. And think about if the code were a thousand lines long, you could accidentally set pi to equal three in the middle and maybe nobody would notice until calculations starting, started coming out with errors. That would be a really bad thing, and it would be pretty embarrassing, too, to end up realizing you wrote code where pi equaled 3. So there's a clever feature we can use in C where you get all the benefits of a variable in terms of giving a name to something, but you don't give up any of the benefits of a constant. And that is this sort of, I don't know, contradictory way of writing it where you 
create a variable that is a constant. So I read this at the type of this variable is constant float. When you have a variable which is a constant, then what it really is is a way of giving a name to a number. So you can use the name in your code, you get all the benefits of having a name, but it isn't a real variable in the traditional sense. So I'll run this first to verify that I can do this. Okay, so it, it works, I'm back to the correct numbers. But if I try and act, you know, set pi to be three, well, the type of the variable is constant float. And if I try and set pi to be three, now the compiler says, you can't do that. On line 24, that's this, you try and assign a value to a read-only variable. So you might think it's weird to artificially restrict the variable to be read-only. The reason this is nice is that if other programmers look at this, they understand on line 12, okay, pi is not meant to actually change, it's actually a constant. And even better, if you're writing code at 2 o'clock in the morning and you forget what numbers are or something and you try to set pi to 3, the compiler stops you. It helps to prevent, to protect you from yourself, which is nice. So this is a great way of making code readable, and certainly pi is, uh, I don't know, an obvious example, but there are lots of constants you work with in an engineering setting where giving them a name can really help make your code easy to understand. So that's what we call a named constant, and you achieve it by putting the word const in front of any variable you want, and that means once you give the variable its initial value, it can never be changed. So it's just a clever way of giving a name to a constant number. Okay, so that's one thing I can do to clean up my code, but I still have all of this basically copied and pasted stuff. So what's the next thing I could do? I think the obvious thing, like we saw before, is I could take this formula and wrap it up inside of a function, so I don't have to keep evaluating it over and over again. Well, notice it doesn't actually help that much, but it's still a good thing to try out. So I'm going to make a new function called circle area, and it's going to take as its argument the radius r, and then its return type is going to be a float. So obviously, if you give me a real number, the area of that circle will almost certainly also be a real number. It would be very difficult to have a, the circle with integer area um, on average, so it's good to make sure we use a floating point return type. And it's worth considering, just because your arguments are type float doesn't mean you have to have a float return type. Your function's return type can be anything you want. And here I'm going to write the more compact, we've seen in previous videos that I could declare variables if I want in here, but we're, gonna, we're past that now, so we'll just say pi times r times r. Here's a nice compact function that computes this formula for me. And down here I will replace ever use of the formula with a call to that function, circle area, and I'll give it radius. And here, again, circle area, and I give it radius. And you might look at this and say, I'm not actually using any fewer characters. This actually sort of takes longer than if I just did the formula over and over. But remember that if you read this, it's way easier to glance at code. If I hand you this code in its current state, and I said, you have five seconds, what does this do? It'll be much more obvious to you from the way that the function is named that you're computing the area of a circle given its radius. The name of the variable, and I guess this text probably helps too with that. So let's try that out. And it does, um, oh, whoops. What well, was the mistake I made? Ooh. So this is a neat one because you can see it's it's uh, compl uh, complaining on line 11 about pi is undeclared, and I've made a mistake, and then the compiler freaked out. It turns out that the uh, the compiler didn't know what to do, and all these other warnings are just because of this first error. So the problem here is pretty obvious. Inside the function circle area, there isn't anything called pi. So that's because I forgot to move pi up here. All right. So we'll try that again. Looks good this time. It's a little bit of on-the-fly debugging there. And then I get the same numbers I got before. Okay, so I have abstracted some stuff. I've made it a bit more modular. And you might notice that for the rest of your entire career, you could now copy and paste this function every time you need the area of a circle. That's helpful. Um, but I still have tons and tons of repetition in my code. What I want is to keep, if, I, if you give me a radius, to keep printing out the area of the circle with radius this is that. That's the part I want to modularize, not just computing the area itself. But I can do that. If I wanted to, I could put this print statement inside a function. So I'm going to call the function I create, and the idea is I'm going to write a function to do this bit, because I noticed that it's the same all four times. I compute the area, and then I print it out with this exact format. I'm going to write a function called, um, I don't know what the return type is going to be, compute area and print. And what are you going to give me as your argument? Well, you will give me a radius. And we'll call it radius this time because that's what it's called down here. 
So we'll put that here. And then here, I'm instead of uh, doing those two lines, I'm going to call compute area and print. Now I've deliberately not explained the process I'm using to write this because I want to contemplate something and I want you to think about it too. Before I give the definition, I want you to think about what we would really need here. So what I want to do is I want to hand the function my radius and I want it to compute the area of the circle, then print out some stuff. Do I need the function to send anything back to main? Well, no. The function's job was to print something out, and it can do that. So I don't need the function to send anything back. And you might notice, I don't do anything with the return value. I just call the function and then I'm done. Sort of like how I call printf. I just have it do something for me, because it turns out printf is a function. I call printf, it does something, and then we're done. I don't need printf to send anything back. So in this case, I don't need the function to return anything. But we'll hold that thought. For the time being, the function is required under all circumstances. You will lose marks. You might lose all of the marks because it could be incorrect alt. It could be a compile error. You are required to give every function a return type. So I need to put something here. Let's give it a return type of int just while we mull this over. OK, but wait. If it has a return type, the function must return a value. And that means I'll just say return 0 because I don't care what the return value is. I never use it for anything. OK, so it returns an int and then it returns zero. And that looks a bit clunky. Why am I returning anything if I never need that? But we don't want to learn a new technique in, unless we absolutely have to. So because I don't need to return anything, I'll just have it return a dummy value like zero. OK. And then here, oh, whoops, I'm going to replace all of my other uses of this code with a call to that function. I'm going to add another new line there to clean that up. And we'll see if that works. OK, so it's complaining. Oh, whoops, I guess I should have declared this variable, float area. And then here, I don't need a variable called area in main anymore. And I can run this. And I'm getting those same numbers as before. And here, I've really cleaned up my code. Now that repetitive action has been packaged up into this small appliance. And I can just use it over and over. And you might notice, I don't even need a variable called radius anymore. I could just keep passing in the numbers directly. Because when I call a function, I, I reduce whatever I have in the brackets to a number anyway. So there's no way the function would know whether I'm passing it the result of a variable or whether I'm passing it in just a number. And so here, I have now reduced what was previously maybe 15 lines of pretty repetitive code to just four sleek looking function calls. And even better, oh, I guess I don't even need this variable anymore. I can delete even more stuff. Um, even better, if you look at this code, you can pretty easily follow what it's trying to do. It's going to do the same thing four times. If you look at code that's been copied and pasted four times, it may not be obvious at first that it's the same exact code every time. But here it's obvious. I'm doing exactly the same thing four different times. And then if I want to know what that is, I can go look at the code in the function. So we have one more thing to sort out which is we know that this function doesn't need to return a value. So it's a bit weird that we give it a return type of int. And just to be clear, if I don't give it a return type, if I just leave that blank, what happens? Um, what it says is actually warning return type defaults to int. Now in our style guide, you're not allowed to do this. You lose a mark on the assignment for letting this happen because it's not, this is really not good code. Old fashioned C allowed you to do this, but even this is a bit ugly because a programmer looks at this and says, what is this function supposed to return? So, this is an example of a function that doesn't need to return anything at all. And we have a very special type that we can use for that. And it's this word void. A function with return type void returns nothing. Void is a specialized type that stands in for nothing, no data. You can't declare a variable of type void because that would be a contradiction in terms. The point of a variable is to be data. Void means no data. But you can use void in other contexts where a type is needed to indicate, nope, no data is supposed to occur. And this is a prime example of that. A function with return type void returns nothing. And that means you can't attempt to use the return type of it. So for example, I couldn't write this. Int x equals two times the return value of compute area because it's going to say, sorry, it's a void value. In fact, the compiler even moralizes about it. It says, I'm sorry, the void value is not ignored as it ought to be. 
Well, it's very nice of you, compiler. I didn't ask for any advice. Um, so I'm, the function returns void. That's a way of telling anybody who uses it, this function does some work, but doesn't send anything back. Um, and it's important that every function whose return type isn't void, so up here I have a function with return type float, if the return type is not void, the function must have a return statement. You are required to do that. The compiler will probably grumble and let you get away with it if you don't, but you are required to ensure that every function in this course that you write without a return type of void does have a return statement. If your function does have a return type of void, it's not required to have a return statement. If a function with return type void reaches that closing curly bracket, then it ends and the scope is destroyed just like you expect. If you want a return statement in a re function with return type void, you can just put return with a semicolon. You don't put a value here because a void function doesn't return any value, but you could put the word return to explicitly return from the function. Although when I write void functions, I typically don't do that. So what we've seen today is an example of how to modularize all the way through. I started by, by using a named constant. I eventually extracted the formula and put it in its own function. And then I extracted a bit of code that used that function. You might notice from this that it's pretty maybe obvious that you are allowed to call a function from inside of another function. It turns out that was actually already obvious because I was always calling functions from inside of main. And printf is a function. Um, one thing you should consider, one exercise to try based on looking at this example is count how many function calls appear in this program. So I'll go through it for this example. There are some other examples in the notes for this. Um, how many function calls? Actually, why don't we count both function definitions and function calls. Okay, so how many definitions are there? Okay, there's a function definition, there's a function definition, and main is a function definition. It is a function, it's an ordinary function with one special privilege, which is that it gets called when the program begins. So there are three function definitions. How many function calls? Okay, there are no function calls in here, just arithmetic. I see this is a function call, circle area, and printf is in fact a function. So there are two function calls here, and then four function calls in main. So that is, um, let's get rid of that, that there are four function calls in total. It is critical in this course, and a rare case of notation being significant, that you can differentiate between a call to a function and the definition of a function. Um, anyway, the next few examples will go through more tracing and a couple more exercises for how to write functions themselves. For example, functions with more arguments.